So welcome back. We're going to continue with chapter two. Now we're going to begin the developmental stages that we're going to learn through this semester. And the first one is before you're even born, conception to birth. So there's a lot of things that develop and form before we are even born. So we're going to go over that and learn what happens in the womb and how do we, how do we even begin from the sperm to the ovum. So the learning objectives are what happens to a fertilized egg in the first two weeks after conception? When do body structures and internal organs emerge in prenatal development? When do body systems begin to function well enough to support life? So you have to understand how we are developed, not just psychologically, socially, but also biologically and physically. So we're going to start with those objectives and move through this chapter. So let's begin by understanding conception to birth. Let's start with prenatal development. So we're going to look at the changes that turn a fertilized egg into a newborn baby. So it takes an average of 38 weeks, right? Humans have a gestational period of about nine months, 38 to 40 weeks, and it's divided into three periods. And these are going to be very important. It's going to be one of your, uh, your assignment, your attendance assignment this week is to put the development into the right period. So you're going to really want to understand what the zygote, embryo, and fetus periods are. So you want to remember that zygote is the fertile egg ends when zygote implants in the wall of the uterus. Okay, so that's the first two weeks. Once it's implanted, once that zygote is implanted into the wall of the uterus, so that's a key term right there, then it becomes an embryo. Before that is still a zygote. And the embryo is when, this is the important thing about an embryo, it's when specialization of cells occurs, okay? So this is the specialization. This is when all the cells are going to determine what's going to be in your body. And then the fetus is the actual uh, final stage. It's the longest. So that's where the baby is going to grow and develop all, uh, everything that's already been specialized. And this is what's key to the fetus stage. This is when the baby reaches the age of viability. So you have three periods, zygote, and the key uh, thing that, dis that distinguishes this phase is it ends when the, feet, when the zygote implants into the wall of the uterus. Second phase is embryo. The key thing of this is when specialization of the cells occur. And the fetus is the final and longest stage, and this is the key term here, is when the baby reaches age of viability. So make sure as we go through, we're going to go through all those stages right now and just really pay attention because you're going to have to fill out this assignment. And you're going to have to also know for your test what uh, development happens in each period. So now we're going to look at the first phase of prenatal development. And as you remember, that is the period of the zygote. And it's week one and two of that 38 week gestational period. So the period of the zygote spans 14 days. It begins with fertilization of the egg in the fallopian tube. And remember, this is the important thing. It ends with implantation of the fertilized egg in the wall of the uterus. We're going to now go over the, those two weeks and those 11 steps and make sure that you understand what happens in each part of this in this period of the zygote. So you're going to see right here is your ovary and oh, the first step is ovulation. So an egg is cell from the ovary. So from here is released. And so you can see that egg cell is released and enters the fallopian tube um, day nine to 16 days of the menstrual cycle. So you have your menstrual cycle between day nine and 16. You're going to release this egg from the ovary. And this is your fallopian tube. Step two, you're going to have fertilization usually takes place in the upper third of the tube within 24 hours of ovulation. So right up here is when fertilization is occurring. So step three, between 24 to 30 hours after fertilization, the male sperm and the female egg chromosomes unite. So that's that sperm and ovum. That's where they're uniting right there. So remember, 24 to 30, 30 hours after fertilization. Egg cells divide for the first time. So now it's fertilized. So now you've got both parts of the DNA from the mom and the dad. Now it's fertilized and now it's going to start dividing. So egg cells divide for the first time. And then 36 hours after fertilization, you have two cells. 
And then you're going to see it's just going to rapidly um, start completing cell division as it moves down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. So then you can see in number six, 48 hours after fertilization, you have four cells. And then after three days, um, you start to form a cluster of 16 to 32 cells. And then at four days, this is you're going to see there's a hollow ball, and there's about 100 cells. So it's very rapid. This, your body's starting to make those cells. Days four to five, the zygote enters the uterus. So this is, you can see, so now it's ended its journey through the fallopian tube, and now it's going to start going into its home. So at day uh, six to seven, the zygote, so we're still referring to it as a zygote, begins to attach to the wall of the uterus. It begins its attachment. So you can see this is the inner wall of the uterus. And day 12 to 14, the zygote is completely implanted in the uterine wall. And what does that mean when it's completely implanted? It's the end of the period of the zygote. So that finishes that period of prenatal care. So as you can see, what they, they call it the miracle of birth. But what they should call it is the miracle of conception because it's harder to have all this happening than it is to, to have a baby. Millions of people have babies, but millions of people have difficulty conceiving. So it's really, this happens, uh, many, many people is very less chance of getting pregnant every month than it is to have a full, to once you're pregnant, to carry to um, full term. Now there are, you know, uh, miscarriages and stuff, but actual chances of carrying to full term once you're pregnant, it's much higher percentage than if you're trying to conceive. So it should be called the miracle of conception and not the miracle of birth. But this is the form. This is the zygote period. And you can see it's ovary, fallopian tube, to the ends when it implants into the uterine wall. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the next phase, which is the embryo. So before we go on to the embryo, I just want to highlight some of the things from uh, the period of the zygote. So remember, the zygote is the fertilized egg. After four days, the zygote is a hollow ball of approximately 100 cells. And those small clusters of cells in the center, the germ disk, will develop into the baby. The cells closest to the uterus become the placenta. So if you remember that picture, it starts to make that ring. And so the middle of it is the, the germ cells, the germ disc is the baby, and the outside ring will, end, will be the placenta that protects the baby and feeds it during the gestational period. Implantation of the zygote in the uterus will trigger hormonal changes that prevent menstruation, and it will, what gives you that positive on your pregnancy test. So once it's attached, to the uterus, that's what tells the body that it's pregnant. If it never attaches, you never um, are pregnant. So even though you might have a fertilized egg, some of the problems with infertility just never can get it to attach. So it only releases those hormones once it's attached, and that's the start of it becoming into an embryo and into a baby. So I wanted to give you a real life example of an ultrasound. This is a 12 day zygote implanted into the wall of the uterus. And you can see right here, that little circle right there is the placenta. And then that's that germ disc, that's the baby. This is done by a uh, transvaginal ultrasound. So it's actually a wand that is um, placed inside the, the vaginal wall. And, to see inside the uterus. So it's not done outside. It's not an ultrasound done on the belly. This actually has to be done in the zygote phase um, with a vaginal ultrasound. But you can see right there, this is 12 days. So this is at implantation, right after implantation. Um, and you can see that um, germ disc and you can see around it, the placenta starting to form. So now we're going to go to this second period of uh, prenatal development. And it is the pre period of the embryo. So you're gonna, gonna wanna remember that is weeks three to eight. So now it is formed the amniotic sac and it's gonna form the umbilical cords. So the amniotic sac is filled with fluid that cushions the embryo and provides a constant temperature. So that's what keeps your baby healthy and safe. That's its environment, that's, that's its home. And the umbilical cord contains blood vessels that run from the placenta to the embryo. So that is where the baby is going to get all its nutrition. That is through that umbilical cord. It's how the, the mom um, gives the nutrition to the baby. So those are the, the two key things in this, um, this phase. 
So all of the nutrients, oxygen, vitamins, and waste products go in and out of that umbilical cord. So you want to remember with the embryo, at, th after, at three weeks after conception, the fertilized egg is about two milliliters long, and it resembles a salamander. And remember, this is the phase that what happens? Specialization of cells occurs. So that is a key, key thing. So all the regions of the brain grow, particularly the cerebral cortex, the body structures and internal organs all develop. You get the first links to the mother via that umbilical cord. So that are all the important things that are happening in the embryo stage. So this is a picture of the embryo at eight weeks after conception. Um, near the end of the period of the embryo, the fertilized egg is recognizable as a baby to be. So when you, if you have ever seen at about, so about eight weeks, it's going to look, it's going to have all its parts. It's going to have, you can see the forming of arms and legs and feet and toes. Everything is in there that needs to be in there. Now it just has to grow. So think of the embryo as the phase that everything is formed. You're going to have like the tiniest, tiniest little human. It's just going to grow and develop and become what it needs to become. Doesn't mean it can function because it's not it's not um, developed enough. But everything is there and in place uh, to just grow and mature and develop into what it needs to be. But no more cells after the embryo are are made. They only develop. So again, this is an uh, a ultrasound. Again, this is still a vaginal ultrasound. Um, of an embryo at 19 days, so we're at an embryo period. It's 4.6 millimeters, and you can see it right in there. That is that baby. I mean, that is the embryo. Sorry, that's the embryo right there, and then that's your, your placenta. And it's probably the umbilical cord, but right there, that is the embryo. And that's what it looks like on a, in a transvaginal ultrasound at 19 days. We're going to follow this baby, and you're going to see it through its periods to see how it grows. So this is that same same embryo and I wanted to show you a little bit further in the embryo period. So this is five weeks and it's grown from four millimeters to 18 millimeters in about two weeks. So you can see right here that you can start to see that's the head, that's the body, that's the arms and feet coming um, and then you can still see the placenta. So this is uh, still transvaginal um, to see it. But yeah, you can see just in those two weeks how much development, how much the specialization of those cells are forming the hands, the feet, the head. All of that is happening here. This is a five weeks. Now let's look at it at eight weeks. Wow, right? Look at how much more formed it is. Look how much bigger this, this embryo is. This went from went like 18 millimeters now to 38. So it's doubled again. It's doubled again in three weeks. So you can see the head, the eyes, the mouth. You can see the body there. So think of all that is happening in the embryo stage. All the specialization of the cells are happening right now. They're forming all those organs, all the, the, the brain tissue, the feet, the muscles. They're all forming them. They're making all the cells that you will need to develop them into full-flown muscles are formed during the embryo period. Every specialization of cell is formed through the embryo period. It does not, once you hit the fetal, the fetal period, then they develop, but they are formed in the embryo period. So that's what you would need to remember. Specialization of cells are formed in the embryo period and they're developed in the fetal period, fetus period. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the third period of prenatal development, which is the period of the fetus. So you can see that this the fetus now is very much larger. It has everything. It looks like a baby. So we can go over a little bit of the structures here, but just remember you can see the fetus is wrapped in the amniotic sac and connected to the mother to be through the umbilical cord. So here's the amniotic sac, this blue right here. Here's all the fluid it's floating in. It's, it's loving this environment. It's warm. It's got its mother's, all its nutrients. Its waste products go out through here. Uh, it's loving this situation, right? 
So this is what we think of. You can see the, the um, placenta right here. That's that cushion. You can see there's the mother's blood. There's the uterine wall. So that placenta allows the mother's blood to come and give nutrients, oxygen, everything into the, to the child, and then the waste products come out. And you can see the chorionic villi here. And what that is is a membrane, a membrane full of blood vessels that surround the embryo. So basically, it's the membrane that holds the mother's blood vessels. So that allows exchange of the nutrients and oxygens and waste and carbon dioxide between the mother and the fetus. So it's just the membrane that holds the mother's blood and that transmission of the waste products and the nutrients to the, the child. And so we're just going to remember that the period of the fetus is weeks 9 through 38. So let's look a little bit more into the period of the fetus. So essential life systems, respiration, digestion, and vision finish developing. So there's a major thing. Uh, what makes a, a fetus viable, right? So one of the main things they look for all those people that want to go into NICU uh, babies and work in the um, NICU, that one of the main things that happens is that they need to get what's called surfactant. Surfactant is a very important um, uh, material that's in the lungs that allows us to breathe. And you hit that between 23, 25 weeks, 26 weeks is when you're at its best so that those lungs can breathe. So that's a major reason why babies don't make it if they're born earlier, because that is what's happening during that time. Your, your lungs are making that surfactant and it allows the, the, the fetus to um, develop the lung capacity. So if it's born that early, they don't have that. And they have very, very difficulty um, with respiration. They may have vision problems because what's happened is that it hasn't fully developed in the fetus yet. So those are the, those um, last weeks are for to develop all those specialization of cells. So it hasn't had the opportunity to do that. So that's why you see a lot of those problems. So remember, it has all its cells, but it hasn't developed them fully. So let's learn a little bit. What's happening to the fetus in 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 this stage of uh, prenatal development. So the fetus experiences taste and hear sounds. So that's why they may say like, when you're, have you had your child and did you crave certain things through your pregnancy and then you find your child likes the same thing? They may have experienced already the taste of that through you sharing your, your diet with the child in, in, um, while you were pregnant. They can hear your sound. So, we know that a lot of, um, they encourage us to talk to the, the, the fetus in the, um, when it's in the womb, read to it, sing to it. It helps with it. They can hear the sounds. They can hear your voice. So that's why often when they come out, they recognize you and they hear you because they've already heard your voice. But it sounds a lot different because they're hearing it from an echo in a, in a cushioned environment to really hearing it in a um, full on uh, stereo sound. So. Think of all those things of the fetus. It's developing. It's beginning its development. It doesn't start developing uh, all those things when it comes out of the womb. It's developing its taste, its you know hearing, its sound, its connections already. So that's why they say so important what you eat, uh, your interaction uh, with your womb, with the fetus. So all those things play a, a key in the development of the fetus. So they consider anything. Um, a premature baby is about 26 weeks. So again, like I said, the lungs don't have enough surfactants that the lung that keeps helps keep the lungs open. So that ha that has uh, results in difficulty breathing, and a lot of them, a lot of the um, fetus then don't make it, or there's long extended times in the NICU. So that's one of the main reasons uh, they want to get you past that 26 weeks. At 22 to 28 weeks after conception, the fetus has achieved the age of viability. So that's a key point. The fetus is the age of viability, and the number is 22 to 28 weeks after conception. Can you think of some other things that happen uh, in this period? If you've had a baby or you've been around someone who's pregnant, what are some of the things that you've noticed that happens in the later stages? So you, one of the big things is the mother feels movement. 
if you've been pregnant, you remember that first movement and how excited you were. And then as you go on, you get paranoid if you don't feel that movement, right? So the, the feeling of movement in your belly is that first connection, um, real connection that a lot of mothers have when having a baby because it makes it really real. Another thing that happens during the uh, fetus period is it finishes, touches on all the essential systems. So that's what I mean by when it just develops all those specialization cells. So the brain becomes developed, your organs fully form, you have all your fingers and toes are at the right length. Uh, your vision is fully formed. Your lungs are fully formed. Your heart. Uh, so just remember, your it's the final and longest phase. And the key to this, the period it ends of the fetus, when it reaches the the age of viability. So it doesn't end. I'll take that back. It ends when you have the baby. But it, the key thing with the period of the fetus is that this is when it reaches the age of viability, and that's between 22 to 28 weeks. So right here, I just want to, we're going to transition. I'm going to show you those ultrasounds again on this same baby. I mean, on this same, um, well, it is a baby when it was born, but at the embryo phase. So this is right before it's going to transition to that fetus phase. So this is 10 weeks and it's 67 millimeters. Last week it was last it's, it's gone up to 20 millimeters. So you can see it's pretty much formed. Everything is going to form the head, the mouth. And you can see it's starting to take up more room. This is 12 weeks. So it's, you can see the hands there it's saying hi. So this is when you can start doing the ultrasound on the belly. So you can start seeing that. So if you've had a baby, you know that great joy in seeing uh, what your embryo looks like at 12 weeks and knowing the sex and the what it's going to be. So this one, she is a girl. So this is a, she's waving here. So that's 12 weeks and then 99 millimeters. So I added that in the womb video, it's under the videos from when the same section that this lecture is in. And it's the National Geographic in the womb video from conception to nine months. It'll show it in a microscopic, the, the sperm and the ovum connecting all the way, all the phases of development. It's about nine minutes. It's really, really neat. Watch this video. Um, definitely there's going to be, you're going to get great information from it. You're going to visually see what we just talked about. And there will probably be something on the test regarding that video. But watch this video. It's pretty neat. And it's in the supplemental below this lecture videos. So now that we understand the three periods of prenatal development, let's look at some of the things that can influence prenatal development. So our learning objectives for this part of chapter two is how is prenatal development influenced by a pregnant woman's age, her nutrition, and the stress she experiences? How can disease, drugs, and environmental hazards affect prenatal development. What general principles affect the ways that prenatal development can be harmed? And how can prenatal development be monitored? Can abnormal prenatal development be corrected? So we're gonna go through over all these things. So it'd be awesome if you know our baby, our the embryo, the fetus, the zygote can all have a perfect environment, but just like the mother that's carrying him, that baby's going to be influenced by all the environmental factors that she's in, she's uh, exposed to and what she exposes the, the, the zygote, embryo, or fetus with her specific choices. So let's look and see what the influences on prenatal development are. Can you guess at what some of them are? Let's see. So let's begin with general risk factors. One of the most obvious ones would be nutrition. What the pregnant woman puts in the body is what she's going to pass to her, her, the embryo and the fetus. So a balanced diet is essential for a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman through passes along her proteins, vitamins, and minerals to the embryo and the, the fetus. Uh, they need to increase their calorie intake between 10 and 20 percent. Uh, not by double, like the old saying, I'm eating for two. No, they just need to increase it by 10 to 20%. Consequences of inadequate nutrition. Premature birth and underweight. 
So if they're not getting a new, enough nutrition in the, in the uh, womb, they're not going to develop correctly. Damage to the baby's nervous system. So the nervous system, what does it need to develop? It needs nutrition. It needs protein. Protein and the proper nutrition, it needs those cells to, to correctly develop. So if the mother is not passing that along to the embryo or to the fetus, that brain is not going to develop. So that's one of the reasons why you're going to see damage to the baby's nervous system. And then the baby is vulnerable to illness. If it's not getting the correct nutrition to keep its it you know, at a proper weight and, and healthy, then it's going to be vulnerable to having illness to strike. If, think with us. When we're not healthy, we're more likely to get sick. Same thing with the baby. Another general risk factor we're going to look at is stress. So if you've been pregnant or you know have been around a pregnant woman, one of the main things that doctors will tell you is to avoid stress. With stress can cause increased blood pressure. With that can cause increased stress on the the baby and if the mom has increased blood pressure and their body's not functioning right the environment that the baby's growing in is going to be adversely affected as well so anxiety during pregnancy can lead to early birth and lower than average weight because they're not they may not be eating enough that stress that increased blood pressure may cause them to have a early term baby uh, all those things that um, do not go along with having a healthy baby they have found studies have found that children are more likely to have behavior and intention problems in preschool. So if they're already developing in the womb in a stressful environment, their body's already having those triggers of anxiety. They're already, they're physiologically already being put through things that are stressful. So they're pre, they are already, as they're after they're born, they've already had body risk, physiological responses to stress. So it just puts them more likely, not all children of this, but more likely to have behavior and attention problems because they've already have had dealt with anxiety and stress in the womb. So how does stress work? Stress hormones reduce flow of oxygen to the fetus. So with the decreased flow of oxygen in the fetus is not good. The, the fetus needs blood, needs oxygen to um, to breathe, to you know make all those those um, develop all those specialization of cells. Uh, stress causes the woman's immune system to weaken, so they're more likely to get sick and pass those illnesses possibly to the baby. And they're more likely to consume alcohol and smoke cigarettes when stressed and less likely to eat healthy and exercise. So because they're stressed, they're gonna, it can cause, it can influence other behaviors. So if you're stressed, just they're not even pregnant, right? You're gonna look at something to release it. So some people might choose alcohol, cigarettes, some people might eat more, some people might eat less, they may not exercise, so it just causes uh, a compensation is sometimes choosing bad compensations, and it doesn't change when you're pregnant. Um, sometimes we just go to those and dip, to relieve that stress. So stress overall is just not good environment for the development of the fetus and the embryo. So it's one of the factors. So some people can't avoid it. So when we're looking through development and we're going to looking through all these stages of development, we're going to be looking at, you know, different socio um, cultural and economic situations and life situations and we're going to see how those affect um, the development because like we said earlier in last chapter that you know timing is everything if you're a 16 year old uh, pregnant female and um, don't have a lot of money and you don't have a lot of education you may have some of these stressors that cause you to maybe want to consume alcohol or smoke cigarettes, or you don't know better. You haven't had the education yet because you're only 16. You don't get good prenatal care and you don't know the difference. Opposed to the fact if that 16 year old waited till she was 30 and um, was, a, it was able to make better decisions. She had more opportunities. Maybe she has an education now. She has a job. She's in a stable environment. So just remember all those theories and stuff that we learned, we're going to think about those and um, not just in development after you're born, but prenatally as well, that can affect the long-term um, development of your child. So those will be some of the influences as we look at when they're four or five and in, in grade school, what were they like prenatally? If you've ever gone to, if you're taking your child to a pediatrician, they're gonna ask you how your pregnancy was. And this is one of the reasons why, because Prenatal development does affect 
development in the uh, later stages in life. So another general risk factor is the age of the pregnant woman. So if you recall from earlier that a woman is born with all the eggs they're going to have for the rest of their lives. They are formed prenatally in the embryo stage. So with that, they age and older eggs have more of a risk of having complications with the pregnancy. So let's look at two different age groups. So we talked a little bit earlier about the pregnant teenager and their children facing many obstacles. So generally lack good prenatal care or economic stability, incomplete education, poverty, and marital difficulties that affect the child's development. So we talked a little bit about that um, just a few minutes ago, how that could affect the pregnant, that teenage pregnant woman. Uh, another one, as I just mentioned, is the age of the eggs um, to be fertilized. So a lot of times they, as you wait to have children, you may have fertility problems and miscarriages in the 30s and Down syndrome risk increases in their 40s uh, because of the age of the, uh, the eggs and the aging system of the reproductive system. So that's why many we talked about, also talked about many people are freezing their eggs. Surrogates, surrogates are a lot more common now. Look at all your celebrities having uh, surrogates for their children. So it's a lot of different options in the infertility uh, healthcare system. So that is one of the things because they found through research that these things happen and why they happen is um, after a certain age. So when do you think, what age do you think would be considered a geriatric pregnancy? How old do you have to be to consider your eggs are considered old? Well, if you can believe it, it's over 35. So if you're a, if you're 35 and your eggs are over 35, they will consider that that is a geriatric pregnancy. Um, even terms um, advanced maternal age. Um, so the best age to have children physiologically. Now it might not be sociologically or psycho psychologically, but physiologically, your body is at the prime age of um, between 20 and 35 years old. And over 35, you're considered advanced maternal age and a geriatric pregnancy. And that's just physiologically, not psychologically or social culturally. So infertility clinics and um, that advancement in medicine has allowed a lot, uh, some of these um, risk factors to decrease or be eliminated. But, right, that's very expensive and not everybody has the opportunity to um, have that technology to be able to do that. So it's not for the masses but it definitely is an as a, uh, option for some to prevent some of these risk factors. Now we're going to look at teratogens. Teratogens is an agent that causes abnormal prenatal development. It could be drugs, diseases, or environmental hazards. So this is what you're going to wanna to know. You wanna make sure you know what that is and some examples. So the first one to give is, is drugs. So obviously some of the ones that you might come to mind would be um, uh, street drugs, illegal drugs, heroin, cocaine, meth. Yes, those would definitely have adverse effects on uh, prenatal development. But other prescription drugs have been, they have found that may be perfectly safe for the mother have caused adverse effects for the, the fetus and the uh, embryo. One example is thalidomide. It was given to women in the 1950s to help them with sleep. It did not give the women any adverse effects, but what they found is that, that it could cause their child to be formed with deformities of um, not born with legs, hands, or fingers. So a drug that was perfectly safe for the mom had adverse effects on the on the child being born. So that's why it's so important and why your doctors will tell you that for pregnant women, you just wanna really limit what you take and make sure that it is safe and tested and researched. You don't wanna take something that is not because they don't know what the long-term or what the effects of that drug has on your unborn child. So that would be an example of a, a teratogen for drugs, not just your illegal drugs, but prescription drugs that have um, no adverse effects for the mother, but have 
abnormally affected prenatal development. And that's a big, that's a really big one because having your child not born with arms and legs because you took a sleep medicine would be pretty devastating. So with that research, um, they have found, you know, that what drugs are safe for pregnant women. But that's just something that we need to be aware of. Um, another one is diseases and environmental hazards. And I'll go over some more of these on the next slide. So this is a great table, a quick reference to see all the teratogenic drugs and their consequences. So if you want to study drugs and their consequences ter for teratogens, going to look at this. So like I said, so alcohol, alcohol is a big one, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome, right? Cognitive de deficits, heart damage, um, growth is retarded so that you don't get, um, you're shorter, you don't have full development of your physical growth. Um, aspirin is another one. That's why they tell you not to take aspirin when you're pregnant. Um, results can result in defects in intelligence, attention, and motor skills. Caffeine, that's why they tell you to limit your caffeine because caffeine can affect lower birth weight, decrease muscle tone. We talked a little bit earlier about cocaine and heroin. Again, it stunts or uh, slows down your physical growth. It can retard that growth. Inability, um, irritability in newborn. So you have a very, you know, they could be positive, actually be born positive for the drug. So they have, you know, they're, they're going through withdrawals. So they're irritable newborns. So a lot of crying, a lot of, you know, unable to soothe. Marijuana, lower birth weight, less motor control. Nicotine, so that's smoking. That's a big one. Um, that retarded growth and possible cognitive impairments and sometimes um, lower birth weight. So with nicotine, what happens is that it constricts the blood flow uh, from the umbilical cord through the placenta, and so the baby gets less oxygen, nutrients, and to grow and develop, and that's why you get that stunted growth and the possible cognitive impairments. And another thing you want to remember, too, with alcohol, it's not just being, uh, you know, what they consider maybe a typical alcoholic where you would drink, you know, every day. It also uh, is affected by binge drinkers, weekend drinkers that drink excessively, but maybe only on the weekends, maybe 15 beers or, you know, that really binge, hard drinking um, weekend drinker. So it's not just your daily drinker, it's the hard, it can be considered the binge drinkers that drink an excessive amount, you know, at uh, inconsistent times. So smoking is one of the most common teratogens uh, that, ha that occurs. Smoking during pregnancy causes damage to the fetus, the infant. Like I said earlier, it constricts blood vessels that lead to less oxygen and nutri nutrients reaching the fetus. Children likely to have impaired attention, language, and cognition skills. Uh, and then regular alcohol consumption carries risk. Fetal alcohol syndrome, which results in slow growth. Heart problems, misshapen faces, and intentional cognitive and behavioral problems. So that's, again, thinking about prenatal development affecting later on development that we're going to look in as we go through the stage age stages. But when we go and to cover that later, I want you to think back to this and prenatally, what did the mother do? Maybe why is that child the way they are? We need to look at the prenatal development and see if that, see if they took some of these teratogens that could have um, influenced how their child is in the later stages of their development. So let's look at disease teratogens. So they're considered bacterial and viral diseases. Those are some of the ones that can be most harmful. So there's a list of the disease and then the po potential consequence for the, the baby once they're born. So with AIDS, you can see that it's the baby could have frequent infections, neurological disorders, or even death. Chickenpox, if the mother is, uh, contracts chickenpox while pregnant, she could have spontaneous abortions, developmental delays, intellectual debilities for the child. Uh, chlamydia, premature, will re can result in the child having a premature birth, low birth weight, eye inflammation, uh, cytomegalovorous, deafness, blindness, abnormally small head, intellectual disability. Herpes, genital herpes, the child could be born with encephalitis, enlarged spleen, improper blood clotting, German measles or rubella, so this is why we get vaccinated, right? Intellectual disability damage to eyes, ears, and heart. And actually, my aunt had German measles when she was pregnant with my cousin, and he was born with an intellectual disability, a lower IQ. So 
I've seen it firsthand. Uh, syphilis and toxoplasm plasmosia. So you can see those are both have um, also consequences. So this is a good table to look at and study and think about the disease teratogens that can affect prenatal development. So now let's look at the environment. What environmental factors, teratogens, can affect prenatal development? So we're going to look at toxins in the food and air uh, can cause an impairment. So we're going to look on this table shows the hazard on the left and the potential consequences on the right for the child when they're born. Air pollution, a big thing in Kern County, right? How is that going to affect our, the children being born? So let's look. We can have low birth weight, premature birth, and lower test scores. So air does matter. Uh, lead. You can have, if you're exposed to lead, the mother, they could have intellectual disability. Mercury. Retarded growth, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy. Um, PCBs. Impaired memory and verbal skills. And x-rays. That's why they um, try not to, they would ask you if you're pregnant for an x-ray because they don't want to expose the fetus to um, x-rays and this is why because you can have um, slow or retarded growth leukemia intellectual disability so when you're pregnant you have to think about all these things how does that going to affect uh, my baby and how do you think they came up with all these ideas all these consequences so remember through that good research and research design they were able to determine uh, what could be applied to the general population and give for general for pregnancy guidelines. Without that good research and uh, making it valid and reliable, we wouldn't be able to apply and keep ourselves safe um, from these environmental teratogens. So good table to review to for the test. So now this poses the question. With environmental factors, how much can a pregnant woman avoid these? Should a pregnant woman use cell phones? How can pregnant women avoid environmental ter teratogens if they do not know that they, what they are? So that's what's important about education. So when we think and we're looking back at that 16-year-old pregnant girl, is she edu even educated? Does she even know that these could hurt her, her unborn baby? Pro maybe not. I mean, probably not. So those things affect development. Uh, the question with cell phones. So that's a big thing that's been happening right now. The research has shown that using the radio frequency um, has been linked to some risk uh, for the for our health, for just general health. So that's why they tell you not to sleep with your cell phone right next to you because of the frequencies. Might um, some research has been linked? Now, not cause. It's just an idea out there that it could cause you know some brain cancers and other things. It's not. It's just starting that research, but they don't know how that would link to, you know, the baby. But that poses the question, you know, how do we go to the extremes or how can we keep a middle ground? And what, you know, what do you value? So it's all these things that we have to think about and weighing um, our decisions. And we use the research and we use all this information to make informed decisions. And then we have to think when we are giving it to the mass population, uh, what do we think is important and what can you say is a, a suggestion and what should be completely recommended? So that's how, that's why it's so important with human development to look at all these things, to evaluate them, to research it so that we can make informed decisions, not just for our lives, but if you're going to be in any type of uh, health education or you're going to be in public you know, health, um, or just even you know in your job in your job in healthcare or other ways or in your life, how do you going to give advice? How are you going to apply these you know research and how are you going to make the choices in your life and the choices for your patients and give them those options? So another thing to think about as we're going through this class is those questions. Um, how we answer those questions is one of the main things of, about the human development. So now let's look at how teratogens influence prenatal development. So there are five general principles. So you're going to want to know them and understand them. So the impact of a teratogen depends on the genotype of the organism. So can a drug approved for use in rats apply to humans? So the genotype is the type. Remember, it's the definition of what that gene does. So is it a gene, you know, that how it and how it affects it. So if the 
do drug trials on a rat, and it showed that like that drug caused cancer in 50 rats. Well, can does that can that be applied to humans? We don't have the same genotype, so can we say that that drug uh, is a no go, or do we need, how do we take it to the next level? So we have to look at the impact of the teratogen depends on what um, genotype is. So when we're doing studies, that's an important thing. So you need to look at that and say, okay, it's drinking, they gave rats, you know, this much caffeine and they, uh, you know, had adverse effects. Well, I'm a human. How does that apply to a human? It doesn't always have direct correlation there. Um, number two is an impact of teratogens changes over the course of prenatal development. And we're going to look at that in the next slide. So I'll go over that a little bit more. The third one is each teratogen affects a specific aspect of prenatal development. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit further in other slides here. The fourth general principle is that impact of a teratogen depends on the dose. Zero exposure is the safest, but if I took, we want to use the example of caffeine. If I drink one cup of coffee, that might be fine. If I drink 10 cups of coffee, that is a lot of dosage of caffeine. It's going to change the effect of that teratogen. So it depends on the dose. And the last, the fifth uh, general principle, damages from teratogens is not always evident at birth, but may appear later in life. Certain types of cancers caused by teratogens occur in adulthood. So like maybe that leukemia that was caused by uh, one of the disease teratogens. It may not show until later in life. Maybe some of the the um, d psychological or behavioral issues may not show until third grade, second grade, first grade. So you have to keep in mind, though, that even though that you may have exposure and some influence of these teratogens on prenatal development, they may not show physically or manifest until different stages later on in the development. So you got to keep an eye out for them. You're not in the clear once they're born. So you've got to keep an eye out through the rest of their life if they were exposed to a specific teratogen. So this figure is a great example to look at how teratogens influence prenatal development. So it's going to look at each stage of that prenatal development. So remember, we have um, the zygote, the embryo, and the fetus. So we're going to look at how taking that teratogen or being exposed to that teratogen will affect it. Um, because that's one of the general principles, right? The stage that it is uh, exposed to, it matters because different things are happening during different stages, right? So let's look at the zygote. That's the period of dividing the zygote implantation and embryo. So what would happen, do you think, if you're exposed to some of those teratogens? So you probably will, like it says down there, have prenatal death. You might not even make it past this because you're exposing it to something that would limit it from attaching to the uterine wall. So the most common one in that zygote stage is this prenatal death. You have a miss, you know, you're just done, you have a miscarriage. In the embryo uh, phase, you can see that what happens during the age of the fetus, if the embryo matters. So week three, you're getting the central nervous system and the heart. Week four and five, you're getting the eye, the heart, the eye, the arms, the legs, and so on. Six, the ear. Seven and eight, you're getting your palate. Your nine um, and your external genitalia. So nine, you're starting the brain and the genitalia. So all those things matter. So if I smoke cigarettes at um, week nine, I might be affecting the brain a lot more. Um, if I if I smoke started at week three, I'm starting right at the beginning. I'm going to affect the central nervous system and the heart. So you can see that you might have major structural abnormalities. And you can see that in orange on the on the um, figure here, depending on when you start that teratogen. And then in the last prenatal development period, the fetal period, you're going to see the full term. You're going to see what happens when you start to, you know, you're going to start to see central nervous, eyes, teeth, palate, genitalia. So it's the development of those. So they may not develop the way they need to. So you may see physiological defects and minor structure abnormalities, and that's in the gold. So they may not, you know, have this, they may have a smaller head and may not develop the full uh, potential of the head. You know, they may have a stunted growth. So remember those things we talked about earlier. But this is you really is a great study guide to and a great visual tool to understand how teratogens affect the prenatal development because it breaks it down 
by the week that that is being developed in the in the embryo I mean in the um, womb and what potentially could be caused by it so let's move on to prenatal diagnosis and treatment so we've come a long way in science we no longer have to wait until the fetus is born to diagnose and treat many illnesses or diseases uh, found early in pregnancy. So we wanna first explore how do we discover and diagnose, what tools do we use? So the first one is an ultrasound. So many of you are probably familiar, you know, we've all most likely have seen an ultrasound performed on a pregnant lady either in the movies, pictures, real life. Um, what they do is it uses ultrasound, uses sound waves to generate a picture of the fetus. You can usually determine the sex between 16 and 20 weeks, and it can detect twins and triplets. So they'll see more than one embryonic sac on the ultrasound. So it's that picture. Uh, and then there is a different types of ultrasounds. The ultrasound can be transvaginal, which I was talking about earlier with that wand before, before the 16 and 20 weeks, or at this time it's the outside wand um, to look at the picture. Chorionic vilus sampling, which is CVS, it can be used to detect a suspected genetic disorder. So these are you really want to understand these prenatal diagnoses and what they're going to um, screen for, as it's really important for the test. So it can be used at 9 to 12 weeks earlier than amniocentesis. So amniocentesis is probably the more common one you've heard of, um, but this one can also detect suspected genetic orders, and its tissue sampled is obtained from the placenta. So this figure shows the example of CVS testing, chorionic vilus sampling. It is obtained from the part of the placenta. You can see they, they insert a tube into the vagina and using an ultrasound scanner to correctly locate the placenta, they can take a sample of genetic material to evaluate. It can be used earlier in the pregnancy compared to amniocentesis. It can be used within nine to 12 weeks after conception. And results can occur in seven to 10 days following CVS. So the other prenatal diagnostic tool is called an amniocentesis, and it's probably one you've heard of. In an amniocentesis, a sample of fetal cells is extracted from the fluid in the amniotic sac. So you can see they, they use a needle to insert into the abdomen, abdomen, through the uterine wall, into the amniotic sac where they take genetic material using an ultrasound scanner to correctly locate the amniotic sac. The fluid in the amniotic sac contains skin cells that can be grown in a laboratory dish and then analyzed to reveal the genotype of the fetus. So before we move on to prenatal diagnosis, I want you to remember with the prenatal testing, both the CVS and the amniocentesis can help um, detect genetic orders such as Down syndrome. But these, the, although these procedures are virtually free of errors, they do come at a price. Miscarriages are slightly 1 or 2% more likely after amniocentesis or a CVS. So it's up to the woman to decide whether they want to take that chance. Um, before having these genetic tests. Um, and another thing you want to remember that amniocentesis, you have to wait longer because genetic material hasn't developed enough in the um, amniotic fluid to be evaluated, whereas CVS can be taken earlier because it's being taken from the placenta. So now that you've had these tests and you have the diagno diagnosis, what, um, what do you do with it? Prenatal diagnosis and treatment. So you've done the test, you've, you've been, your fetus, your embryo has been given a diagnosis. What do you do with that information? So let's look at fetal medicine, and it's a growing um, area of medicine. It's treating the prenatal problem before birth. So how do they do that? So we're going to look at a couple, uh, a few examples here. Spina bifida, uh, they've had great advancements in this. It can be corrected with prenatal surgeries, and I'm going to show, I'm going to have a video in our supplemental videos that you can watch, and it's just about three minutes, and it actually shows how they do that. It's really cool. Uh, hypothyroidism, it can be treated with the injection of hormones. 
and genetic engineering involving replacing defective genes with synthetic normal ones. So that's pretty, that's pretty uh, inventive there. That is genetic engineering is best. So that's science uh, coming to full fruition, treating the, the genes before the, they are ever able to fully um, reach its full potential. So let's take a look and see what some of that fetal medicine is about. So I just want to remind you to watch the spina bifida surgery. It is a only about three and a half minutes. It's a great way to see prenatal treatment. It actually shows the surgery and it shows the after effects of the patient being able to to walk and jump and everything. So spina bifida, spina bifida is happens when the the closure of this does not happen at this at your spine and in turn your nerves don't develop correctly. So you have weakness and um, difficulty walking and development of your lower extremities and a lot of spina bifida patients end up in wheelchairs so uh, being able to fix it prenatally is lasted in great results for our patients um, so it can be corrected in the seventh or eighth month of surgery surgeons can cut through the pregnant woman's abdomen wall to expose the fetus and then cut through the fetal abdomen wall the spinal cord is repaired and the fetus is returned to the uterus. Um, it's far from full pros and the best techniques in the ideal times are used um, are still unknown. So they still doing research, but watch that video and it will show you how um, prenatal surgery is done. And then they talk about genetic engineering. So when a defective genes are replaced by synthetic normal genes. So the example they give in your book is the sickle cell example. So, um, so you can recall that when a baby inherits a recessive alley, so that's that two small letters for sickle cell from both parents, the child has misshaped red blood cells that they can't pass through their capillaries. So they get um, difficulty with the clotting. In theory, it should be possible to take a sample cell from a fetus and replace the recessive genes with dominant genes. So they're going to actually take the, the recessive genes and replace it with the repaired dominant genes. Um, and then they would multiply and cause normal blood cells to be produced. But as with fetal surgery, translating idea into practice is challenging, and researchers are still trying to um, study these techniques um, with mice and sheep. It hasn't gotten to the human level yet, um, so that they're and they have done some on older children, so given maybe some types of um, gene therapy. However, reaching use of this method in fetal medicine is still years away. So there's been a lot of research on that. And in 20 years, we may see that as being the normal. But genetic engineering um, at the prenatal level is definitely, um, you're going to see more of that. So make sure you watch this spina bifida video, video. All right, so we're making it to the last part of the chapter. We've talked about conception. We've talked about prenatal development. Now let's have that baby. So let's think about labor and delivery. Let's look at the learning objectives. What are the stages of labor and delivery? What are natural ways of coping with the pain of childbirth? What adjustments do parents face after a baby's birth? What are some complications that can occur during birth? And what contributes to infant mortality in developed and less developed countries? Let's go over the stages of labor and delivery. For those of you who have had children in the class, this may be review and you'll understand it a little bit more. And for those who have not had any children or are male in the class, let's go over it and learn what those stages of labor and delivery are. So labor and delivery include three stages. Begins when the uterus contracts and ends when the placenta is expelled. So having a baby, stage three does not end when the baby is born. You have to deliver the placenta as well. All those people that have had babies know that your job is not done. Everybody else looks at the baby, but your job is not done. So first stage takes about 12 to 14 hours. It's when the uterus begins to contract and the where the contractions are irregular. And the dilate, you begin the dilation of the cervix. So you can see in the picture right down there by the baby's head, that starts to dilate, that starts to open. That's what that means. Stage two is when you push. Um, you're going to push the baby with the contractions. They say it's about an hour during this stage. I could argue a little bit more on my own 
childbirth that was a lot longer and for some of you may have the same experience but they say on average it's about an hour in stage two and this is when the baby passes uh, the opening in the cervix the cervix is fully dilated to 10 centimeters and so you can see in that picture the cervix is open and the baby's head is passing and that is stage two and stage three is the last parts where you have the baby completely out and then, then you push the placenta out as well so the placenta is what's been the the nutrients for that baby has been that little sack that's been carrying it. You have to deliver that and then uh, cut the umbilical cord so that you're cutting that um, connection from the mom. And those are the stages of labor and delivery. So let's look at some of the approaches to childbirth. So again, if you've gone and have if you've gone through Lamaze or you've had children, you may be familiar with some of these. And if not, you're going to understand and learn them as well. So the first approach to childbirth is from Grantley, Dick, Reed, and Ferdinand Lamaze. So that's where we get Lamaze. And it's advocated for the natural. So you need to remember who were the natural advocates for natural childbirth. And that's Grantley, Dick, Reed, and Ferdinand Lamaze. So natural, prepared childbirth over medical procedures. So ver varieties of prepared childbirth share features of Birth is more problem-free and rewarding when parents understand what is happening. Natural methods of dealing with pain emphasized over medication, so relaxation through deep breathing and visualization. So they teach you a lot about breathing techniques to distract you, to breathe through the pain, um, positioning, all that stuff to naturally, how do you deal with pain? And interestingly enough, I actually use some of these techniques when I'm treating my patients in physical therapy. How, because I, a lot of my patients have pain and they have to work through pain. So I use that concept. How do you breathe through pain? So when you're having pain, you want to exhale. You don't want to hold the tension in because the more you hold the tension in, the more tight, the tighter your muscles, the more tension you have, the more pain you're going to have in those muscles. A contracted muscle has more pain than a relaxed muscle. So actually, these techniques don't just apply to labor and delivery because labor is pain. They apply to any type of pain. So if you have pain, you, I would say you breathe through, you exhale as you're getting the pain. Having breathing techniques is a distraction from a distraction is one way to um, deal with pain. We use different types of distraction, right? We watch TV or we try to get our mind off it. So breathing is relaxation, relaxing the muscles because relaxed muscles cause less pain. And it's also used as a distraction because distraction can help you forget or change your mind or not focus on the pain. Now, do these completely work? No, you're not going to, you're obviously going to have pain, but it's a way to deal with it so that you can have more natural childbirth and they believe using less medications is better. And having a supportive coach helps during delivery. So those are all the components of that prepared childbirth experience. So before we go on to adjusting to parenthood, I wanted to talk a little bit about reproductive technology. It's becoming much more popular and much more available to the general population uh, for the people choosing to have children later in life or having difficulty with getting pregnant. So let's talk a little bit about it. What you want to understand, we're going to talk about the most invasive parts. There's other types of reproductive technologies, but in vitro fertilization is the one we're going to talk about. And what that entails is mixing sperm and egg into a petri dish, then placing that fertilized egg into a, the uterus in hopes of implantation. So remember, that's that zygote phase, and uh, and to have a baby. So what it entails is that the woman will be taking hormones and medicine to produce a lot of eggs. Once the egg, she's ovulated at that time and produce those eggs, she's going to go in and the doctor is going to put her under a light anesthesia and extract those eggs. So a good goal is 20 to 30 eggs. Once the doctor has those eggs, he's going to get a sample of sperm from the father and then he's going to put the sperm and the ovum, the egg, together to create an embryo. And out of that 20 to 30 embryos, the goal is to have maybe 8 to 10 viable embryos that actually fertilize. Out of that eight to 10 fertilized embryos, he's gonna take maybe the best four and have and decide which ones to implant. Usually it's one to two, depending on the reason why the female can't get pregnant. 
And once they decide on the most viable, they will insert them into the uterus in hopes of implantation. They do that by using an ultrasound to guide where the uterus lining is, and they will implant, the, implant that embryo. The other two, they have the option to freeze to use at a later date for another pregnancy. Now, another concept with reproductive technologies is PGD, and this is actually what you're going to be looking at in the discussion group, the ethics of it, and just talking about when and why we should use it or not use it. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis involves removing a cell from an IVF embryo, like we talked about earlier, to test for a specific genetic condition. So what they do is about day four, day five, if you remember from the zygote, uh, that about day four, they'll have 100 cells in that embryo. They're going to take one of those cells and they will develop a test specifically to your diagnosis. So they're going to take take um, genetic material cheek swab from both parents, the mother and the, fa the father, and the, whoever is carrying the disease. So say that you had Huntington disease and the father was carrying it. They're going to take some DNA sample from the, his siblings or his parents to extract his exact DNA of his Huntington disease. So that goes into a genetic lab. They they develop a test specifically based on all those genes. So if you remember the genes markers at ACGT, they're going to find the recipe for his Huntington's and they're going to set a test and develop a test that will be able to diagnose if a cell has that specific Huntington's. So at day five, they're going to take one cell of that embryo. They're going to send it to the genetic lab. That genetic lab is going to run that test that they developed specifically for his Huntington's disease. And they're going to determine if that embryo has that, that disease. Then that allows them, so if they have six to eight embryos they're going to test, they can see how many have the disease. So then they can choose to put implant non-Huntington embryos to ensure that they're not passing on these genetic diseases. So that's what PGD is. So in the discussion group we're going to talk about, and there's an article I want you to read, um, about the ethics and just the use of it. So it's going to be a good discussion on how we use this technology and what are our, um, where do we draw the line. So I just wanted to have you understand it. And the next slide you're going to see actually how they take the cell out of the embryo. So this is the slide for the extraction of a single cell. The video is actually in the supplemental videos below this lecture. So it's a 30 second clip. Look at it and see how they take it out of the embryo. And that's just one cell and they'll be able to determine if that embryo has that disease. So take a look at that. So these are some of the diseases that can be tested with PGD. So most common diseases used for BG, PGD, pre-genetic diagnostics, cystic fibrosis, Ty Sachs disease, spinal muscular atrophy, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, muscular dystrophy. And then some of those X-linked, remember the ones we talked earlier, fragile X, hydrocephalus, X-linked hydrocephalus, and then autosomal dominant disorders. So von Hippel-Lindau, Huntington's disease, the one I use, Marfan's, um, early onset Alzheimer's. So basically that means those dominant disorders so that if you remember when we first looked at genes, it's that dominant disorder. So if you have it, you have a 50-50 chance of passing it. It's not a recessive passer, it's a dominant. So if you have it, you have a 50-50 chance of passing it. So these are just some of the questions that you can be talking about in your discussion group, the ethics of IVF and PGD. What should be the limitations of PGD for genetic use? Choosing the sex of the baby. So they can also take that cell and tell if it's a male or female. Do you think that that's okay? Is that ethical? How many eggs is too much to implant? You remember Octomom? What do you think of that? Should there be a limit? Should there be an age limit for women for IVF? So there was just a family in India last year that I think she's the oldest woman to have, I believe she had twins, and she's in her 70s. 
Is that too old? Is that fair to the child? What do you guys think? Should you be able to pick your surrogate embryo based on the parents? So should you be able to choose, you know, specifically like a designer baby? All these questions are, you know, bring up the ethics. With new technology, there's ethical decisions. So just because you have the technology doesn't mean you should go full and use it to its full potential. So that's one of the things I want you to discuss if you choose to discuss, um, choose that article. And in your responses, you know, the ethics of IVF and PGDs. Use this, use the lecture, use the book, use that article as evidence to support your ideas. But um, the good topic we're going to discuss. I look forward to seeing what you got your thoughts are on that. So now let's go back to after you've had the baby and now adjusting to parenthood. In what ways do parents' lives change after the birth of a baby? So you can imagine almost everything changes, right? You've had a baby, you have another person that needs you 100%. So nothing is going to be quite the same. Approximately half of mothers experience irritability and resentment after the birth of a baby. That's pretty normal, right? We're going to have a lot of hormones coursing through us, a lot of new stressors uh, to deal with. So, you know, experiencing irritability and resentment would be an expected, you know, cause after that. But for about 10 to 15 percent, it develops into something much more serious, postpartum depression. Uh, some of the signs are decreased appetite, poor sleep, and low self-worth. Self uh, one of the things that can help with that is breastfeeding can reduce the risk of postpartum depression. It's becoming much more talked about and with communication and resources now. So hopefully more women, if they're feeling this or if you're noticing, you know, your partner or someone in your family having these severe, you know, responses that they get help because it being talked about more is allowing these women not to be, you know, feel embarrassed or feel ashamed because, you know, they're not connecting with their baby or they're so sad where, as you know, years ago, women wouldn't talk about it because they were too ashamed to bring it up. But now with, you know, our communication and our openness and, the ability to get help is so much, so much more important that we allow these resources for postpartum depression. So before we move on to birth complications, I want you to ask, ask the question, we talked about the mother, what about the dad? So the dad didn't carry the baby, the dad didn't get to experience the birth, so, and the, the baby needs the mom for so many things, right? The breastfeeding, um, so a lot of time spent with the mom. How do you think the dad might feel? So what they have found out through research and is that dads, you know, feel left out. Um, they feel like they, you know, they don't get to connect with their partner and the baby as much. So some ways that they can do to help with this is that maybe, you know, get up with the mom if she's breastfeeding and help, you know, set her up and set the baby up so that she doesn't, um, have to do much so much job so she can um, get more sleep and then they're connecting together they can reorganize their schedule so they're you know on with each other if they're not um, if they are introducing the bottle have him do a feeding um, those things so finding ways to have the dad connect not just to the baby but to the mom so that she can um, get more sleep she can have more time to herself so that she doesn't feel that burden and dads feel more of the connection not only with the baby, but with the mom, those are ways to adjust better to parenthood. So let's now look at some birth complications. Uh, this table shows common birth complications. Uh, so let's kind of look a little at that a little bit. So the first one is cephalopelvic disappropriation. And so what happens is we're during the birthing process, the infant's head is larger than the pelvis and it's making almost makes it impossible for the baby to pass through the birth canal. Um, a second complication is irregular position. And this happens when the, in the sh shoulder presentation, the, ba the baby is lying crosswise in the uterus and the shoulder appears first. Uh, in breech presentations, the buttocks appears first. So that would definitely not be uh, an easy birth. Preeclampsia, so that is when a pregnant woman has high blood pressure, protein in the urine, and swelling in their extremities due to fluid retention. And um, a lot of times they take the babies early 
because high blood pressure can cause a lot of stress for that baby. So a lot of times they'll plan um, induce or plan a C-section. And they're always monitoring your blood pressure all the time at the doctor. Prolapse umbilical cord, and that's what happens when the umbilical cord precedes the baby through the birth canal and is squeezed shut, cutting off oxygen to the baby. So that's what they would consider in a hypoxic event, which is hypoxic is just a lack of oxygen. So a lot of times that's what happens to your babies that are born with cerebral palsy. It's because the umbilical cord wraps around the um, the neck cutting off oxygen or even infant death. So those are just some common birth complications to be aware of. So just remember that some birth complications have dangerous effects. I talked about the hypoxia. If the infant does not get enough oxygen due to a disruption in the blood flow through the umbilical cord, so it's wrapped around, um, they could have long lasting um, injuries, cognitive, uh, developmental delays, that, that cerebral palsy example. Um, and preterm babies are born before this 36 week. They sometimes have developmental delays, um, but they usually vanish by two or three week years of age. So they just kind of take a little bit longer to catch up. So that's why it's important when they ask you or when you're looking at babies, when were they born? What was their gestational age um, and not just their birth date? So you want to know how if they were if they were premature. And like it says, it usually just takes so they just take a little bit longer because they're still they're still taking extra time to develop outside the womb what they would have done inside the womb. So usually by two to three years, they um, they catch up and you can't tell the difference. But that all, that all depends to how preterm they were. So just remember with birth complications, when babies experience many birth complications, they are at risk for becoming aggressive or violent and for developing schizophrenia especially if they later experience family adversity, such as living in poverty. So that's a combination of a lot of birth complications. So just remember, keep that in mind, that we always have to think of the prenatal uh, complications uh, when we're looking at development later on in life. Another birth complication is small for date. So those are those babies born um, in a normal due date, 30, past 38 weeks, but they are weighing in small, so less than average for a full-term baby. And those babies usually are a result of mother's alcohol consumption or nutrition, poor nutrition. Uh, the ones that are most vulnerable are those weighing less than 1,500 grams or 3.3 pounds, and they're especially at risk for the following. Development of intellectual and motor skills, delayment, needs stimulation to prevent developmental delays, and parent training and positive home environment are essential in counteracting, counteracting low birth weight. So these special needs babies have in the NICU, for all you nurses that want to be NICU, they're called giraffe beds. So they stimulate a womb. So they're temperature control, they are have all the bells and whistles in them. They cost about two hundred thousand dollars. We work on getting them donated um, to special charities at Memorial, but um, yeah, these special giraffe beds that help foster that uh, development. So if you're thinking about being in the NICU or you're thinking about treating these babies, you need to. We have NICU PT physical therapists and NICU occupational therapists that start when they are in this, they are this small, developing those motor skills. They, they're working on, the biggest one is feeding, and because a lot of that is obviously it's most important to getting the, the baby nutrition and getting them being able to take a bottle uh, or breastfeed. So they're working on the sucking, those reflexes that may not have developed in order to those motor skills. So one of the biggest ones is, is feeding. So they teach stimulation to prevent developmental de delays. So they're teaching the baby, they're teaching the nursing, and they're teaching the parents on how to stimulate the um, motor skills in order to, to feed themselves, to suck, to swallow. And we have physical therapists that start in to, to, to stimulate the developmental um, motor skills needed for progressing to eventually, you know, tracking objects, rolling, you know, um, all those developmental milestones. So we start early. We start early stimulation of these babies in the NICU um, to get these delays. So the sooner you can do it, the sooner that we can um, that develop. You're less likely to see um, 
problems later on. Now, these children are probably going to have long-term problems. Um, how severe just depends on the actual diagnosis and uh, of, the ch of the baby. But all this NICU um, environment is uh, set up to stimulate this. So one of the big things is parent training and positive home environment. So we've got to teach them when they go home from the hospital to follow the same guidelines, to stimulate, stimulate, stimulate. The brain is forming all these, developing all these cells now, and you're setting that hard drive for later on in life. So we need to teach the parents how to play, position, and treat their child to stimulate these areas so that their development um, continues to go in the correct. Um, Memorial also has a high-risk clinic where the NICU transitions uh, once they're home so that they follow up with the doctor and an occupational therapist and a physical therapist to go over these training uh, and positive home environment and skills to promote motor and intellectual uh, skills. So it's a two-year program follow-up so that those first two years home, that's when it's so important for every child, but especially for a high-risk child, to stimulate that because they are not going to naturally stimulate themselves. So all you NICU nurse, future NICU nurses, this is what um, you'll be doing. This is why it's so important. The last thing we're going to talk about is infant mortality. Infant mortality rate is the percentage of infants who die before their first birthday. Many women in the U.S. receive inadequate or no prenatal care. So again, we're talking about those young, uh, like the example that we use frequently is that 16-year-old young woman having a baby. Um, Socioeconomic factors, poverty, lack of education, lack of resources, um, not having access to prenatal care. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to look at what do countries with low inf lowest infant mortality rates and have in common, and what about those with the highest? So... Maybe that, so when we think about why many women in the U.S. receive inadequate or no prenatal care, um, maybe that's why we have a lot more low birth weight babies, and that could be prevented with regular prenatal care. So that's one thing that um, if you're in public policy or public health that you could be advocating for is education programs for prenatal care to all pregnant women um, to fight that. So let's look at the next figure and compare those. So as you can see in this figure, this is infant mortality rate, right? and the red is developed nations, and the uh, the blue is least developed nations. So you can see where do we fall? <laughs> Not great. So Turkey is number one in developed countries, and we're number two. So why do you think that? So a lot of people believe, and research has shown, is that, like we talked about in the earlier slide, is access to prenatal care and for everyone. So something to think about is why we are high, and it's not always a cut and dry answer. And what statistics are they looking at um, in infant mortality? But one of the reasons why that they found is because of our lack of um, prenatal uh, care to everyone. And then if you look at the least developed nations, you can see Afghanistan has 120 um, deaths per 1,000. So you can see just between developed and least developed how much more, how good health care uh, matters and how, look at Japan, they have what, like two and a half deaths per 100. So a good thing to do if you wanted to follow up is Google why Japan and the U.S. have such different infant mortality rates, and maybe we can take some um, ideas from Japan. So this ends Chapter 2, Biological um, Development. So we looked at preconception from genes all the way to labor and delivery and having the baby. So next week, we're going to start on the infant, and we're going to look at the development of the infant from um, 0 to 2. So... This week, look at your, watch the videos that I have underneath here. Uh, do your assignment this week is the uh, prenatal periods of, de of development, matching it with the correct developmental sequence. Fill that out. And your discussion group this week is on genes, uh, genetics, 
ethics and PGD and in, and in vitro, and we're going to look at the ethics of that, and you're going to have two articles to read. They're very, they're very short, uh, so you're going to pick one of them. You're going to write on it, and you're going to read both because you're going to pick one and write on, and then you're going to respond to two of your peers here, and one of the responses has to be on the other article. So have fun with that. I look forward to your responses, and have a great rest of your week.